On the 26th of November 1942, an attempt was made by the Soviets to envelop the Axis formations near Chernyshevskaya. But while the 112th Cavalry Division did strike against the 354th Grenadier Regiment and managed to get across the river at Ozinovsky, the 21st Cavalry Division made no progress against the 22nd Panzer Division, defending Chernyshevskaya itself. Both sides threw reinforcements at the problem, hoping to turn the tide. The 8th Guards Tank Brigade struck against the Romanian 14th Infantry Division and the 22nd Panzer Division, crossed the Schur and captured several villages in the area, including Chernyshevskaya. But the rest were unable to make much progress. And as a result of 48th Panzer Corps' previous efforts, most of the 5th Tank Army's units had remained in the Perelazovsky and later Chernyshevskaya areas rather than heading south as originally planned. Thus, a large gap had opened up along the Schur. 5th Tank Army still aimed to capture the towns on or south of the Schur, currently guarded by a host of German Kampfgruppen. But to do this, Romanenko would need more infantry, so he asked Vatutin for reinforcements, and a bunch of divisions were transferred to Romanenko's command. They marched south as the Germans hurried to solidify their defences. One such defence occurred at Oblivskaya, where Soviet artillery rained down upon Fiebig's aircraft, destroying numerous Stukas and damaging the runway. Fiebig and Richthofen were forced to retreat to Tasinskaya, leaving Group Starhill, which had just been flown out of the pocket, to defend this forward position. To the east, Butkov's 1st Tank Corps, now with just 20 tanks, failed to make any progress at the Don, despite the fact that the German Kampfgruppen from Sorofikino to the Don only had about 9,000 men in total. Kampfgruppe Zella set up defences in the Denkin area and was attacked by the forward elements of the 38th Motorized Rifle Brigade, which had been sent up from the south. On their flank, the 158th Tank Regiment continued its fight with Group Schmidt, taking Lyapachev and advancing to a village two kilometres north of Lugovsky. But they were unable to go any further, so Sinkovich requested reinforcements from Volsky, who contemplated the idea. To the south, the remains of the Romanian 1st, 2nd and 18th Infantry Divisions created a thin line along the southern bank of the Aksai River and the 61st Cavalry Division advanced from the east and came across Camp Group Panvitz and Group Korn. A fight broke out that lasted all day, with the exhausted Soviet cavalry being beaten back in confusion. Seeing this, the 91st Rifle Division marched westwards to help out. Even though the Soviets were having trouble here, the Germans would need reinforcements if they were to stabilise the line or mount a relief attempt. So the OKH informed Manstein that the 57th Panzer Corps with the 23rd Panzer Division would be transferred to him from Army Group A in the Caucasus. The 6th Panzer Division was travelling by train as well and was nearly at Kotelnikova, and the 15th Luftwaffe Field Division was on its way too. The 15th Luftwaffe Division had only just formed, though, and would be of questionable quality. But the other two Panzer Divisions were promising reinforcements. Meanwhile, the southern flank of the pocket remained static, with neither the 64th nor 57th Armies making any progress against the German defences. But to the northwest, Chistikov sent the 277th Rifle Division and the 86th Cavalry Regiment across the bridgehead over the Don that his cavalry had carved the day before. They surprised the German forces at Peskovatka, taking half the village, before Latman's 14th Panzer Division counterattacked. Major Bakanov was killed, and only a small number of men from his regiment managed to get away. Nonetheless, the Soviets kept up the pressure on Peskovatka as the 5th Guards Cavalry Division reached the outskirts of Sokarevka, where it battled the 16th Panzer Division. The Soviets were reinforced by the 26th Tank Corps coming up from the south, while the 376th Infantry Division moved up to hold the line just as the 16th Panzer Division was about to fall back. These moves resulted in the line being held for now. 
and Batov's army attacked the Don bridgehead, advancing several kilometers against the Germans. But they were unable to stop the final regiment of the 376th Infantry Division and the last two regiments of 384th Infantry Division withdrawing from the northern half of the bridgehead. Now, just two regiments from the 44th Infantry Division, plus a battalion-sized Kampfgruppe from the 16th Panzer Division, remained on the western bank of the Don, and these began to withdraw over the river. It took until the early hours of the next day for them to get across, but yes, the 11th Army Corps was finally over the Don. Well, most of it. About 700 German vehicles were unable to get out, falling into Russian hands, and are destroyed. Not only had the Soviets pushed the Germans over the Don, but they had wiped out 30% of the personnel from the 44th, 376th, and 384th Infantry Divisions, and destroyed half their artillery and anti-tank guns. Strecker's corps was now made up of a mix of regiments and battalions, rather than full divisions as shown on the maps, and he was keen to pull back from the Don to a new line to the southeast, situated on a long ridge line in the area west of the Rashoshka River. In the meantime, Strecker's units continued to resist more Soviet assaults, as the newly freed 24th Panzer Division was shifted east to the 94th Infantry Division's area on Zeidlitz's request. Because the 94th Infantry Division had been devastated during its recent withdrawal, it now only had 4,500 men left. The division was disbanded, and the men were consolidated into the 24th Panzer Division, although this wasn't officially done until the 2nd of December. The reinforced 24th Panzer Division then struck at the 64th Rifle Division, retaking some of the ground that they had lost in the previous days. Chistikov's 21st Army attacked once more, but by this point, the Soviets were exhausted, and Plieve's cavalry corps was needed by the 5th Tank Army to form an outer encirclement line. They were, therefore, pulled out of the line, leaving the 21st Army with just five rifle divisions and two weak tank corps to do the impossible take on the 14th Panzer Corps. Worse, one of these, the 63rd Rifle, was in reserve and being converted into the 52nd Guards Rifle Division, and thus couldn't help at this time. The offensive, therefore, went nowhere. The Soviets probed the southern flank of the pockets, but again made no progress. Then the 60th Mechanized Brigade was pulled out of the line and sent to reinforce the 158th Tank Regiment, at the same time that Group Schmidt was pulled out of the line and sent to the Sorovikino sector. Group Schockel was left to defend Logovsky from the Soviet tanks, which it was unable to do. But Commissar Sinkovich was killed as he led his T-34s into combat. Thus, this was a Pyrrhic victory for the Soviets. After yesterday's reversal, Shapkin ordered the 61st and 81st Cavalry Divisions and the 85th Tank Brigade's 35 tanks to attack towards Kotelnikova again. They scattered the Romanian remnants in front of them and reached the area by the late morning. But Kampfgroup Panvitz held the Soviets off as German trains entered the station from the west. This was extremely good timing, as the first elements of the 6th Panzer Division had just arrived. The train pulled into the large station. Suddenly, the earth shook with a hail of shells. The ground quivered, black earth was thrown up on all sides, the windows were shattered, the brakes screamed, the wheels screeched, and, with a sudden jolt which threw men and equipment into a heap, the train came to a halt. It was lucky that General Rouse, commander of 6th Panzer Division, had insisted on loading the trains inefficiently and against regulations. Rather than loading the trains by type of weapon, ammunition and equipment, which would economise space, he decided to load his units by their respective combat elements. Thus, his men could deploy straight from the trains against the partisans on the 4,000 km journey from France, but also fight as soon as they reached Kozlnikova. It was less efficient in terms of train usage, but it paid off, as the Soviets were in the train station itself and charged forwards to attack them. The Germans fired back from the carriages and then leapt from their trains and went straight into battle. 
The infernal din caused by detonating shells and yelling Russians was drowned out by ear-splittering cheers from our infantrymen, who, led by Colonel Unrhein, commander of Panzergrenadier Regiment 4, rushed forwards with bayonets and hand grenades to fall upon their enemies. Although it required ferocious hand-to-hand -hand fighting, in the course of an hour our grenadiers had wrested the station from them, then proceeded to mop up the freight cars, buildings and other railroad installations in the area. And with this help, Panvitz rallied his own cavalrymen, as well as some tanks in a nearby repair shop, and defeated the 61st Cavalry Division. After wiping out the Soviet artillery, they chased the Soviet cavalry westwards, helping save the 6th Panzer Division from being hit by shells as they arrived. And with their forces spread thin in the south, now facing a full Panzer Division, the tide had turned for the Soviets in this area. To the north, forward elements of the 38th Motorized Rifle Brigade attacked Group Zeller, but went nowhere. And to the north, Schockel continued to resist against Butkov's tanks, while the other Kampfgruppen knocked back small probes across the Schur. Unfortunately, the sources aren't clear exactly what happened in this area, but it appears that the 55th and 112th Cavalry Divisions were relieved by other rifle elements, presumably the 50th Guards and 346 Rifle Divisions, before heading south. Therefore, Group Vandka and the other non-swear wordy units in the area skirmished with the 21st Cavalry, the 50th Guards and the 346 Rifle Divisions, and Chernyshevskaya changed hands once more. Nearby, the 1st Guards Army struck at Hollett's forces, and the 266th Rifle Division suffered the loss of one of its regiments in a German counterattack. Worse, the Germans seized bridgeheads over the Krivaya River, which was an unexpected reversal for the Soviets. It's at this point that Manstein received a telegram from Hitler explaining why the 6th Army had to sit in place and not leave Stalingrad. The reason he gave for deciding to hold fast to Stalingrad was that if we abandon it now, we should have to try all over again next year, at an even greater cost, to regain what we had sacrificed so much to win in 1942. Although Manstein sympathised with this view, he responded by saying that, with the forces he was about to receive, the best they could hope for was to link up with the 6th Army and have it withdraw through the corridor that they were about to forge. Staying in Stalingrad in these circumstances wasn't an option. Nonetheless, Hitler sent a message to the defenders of Stalingrad, ordering them to hold on. Under all circumstances, you have to hold the positions in Stalingrad, which you have taken with so much blood under the command of energetic generals. The Führer has promised help. Until then, we must hold. If the whole army behaves like one fighter, we will manage. Tell everyone, the Führer will pull us out. Not if the Soviets could help it. But then again, they had their own problems. Currently, Rokossovsky was in charge of the 66th, 24th and 65th armies. Vatutin had control of the 21st army, and Yeremenko had control of the 57th, 62nd and 64th armies. So, the responsibility for the pocket was split up between three separate commands. Well, this was inefficient. So, as the first step to solve this issue, the 21st Army was transferred from Vatutin's southwestern front to Rokossovsky's Don front meaning there were just two fronts now dealing with the trapped 6th Army. It also meant that Vatutin could concentrate on the outer encirclement front rather than have his attention pulled in two directions, like Yeremenka. So this move simplified the command and organisation structure. It did leave Yeremenka commanding two different axes, and unbeknownst to the Soviets, it was Yeremenka's axis that Manstein was about to strike, as we're about to see. At the beginning of Operation Uranus, the weather was terrible, grounding aircraft on both sides. But once the weather had cleared on the 24th of November, the Soviet Air Force took to the skies whilst the Germans were pulling back from their own airfields and simultaneously trying to set up the airlift operation. 
This granted the Soviets air superiority throughout this period. And for the first time, the Axis lost more aircraft, 257, versus the Soviets, 217, in the final half of November, with most of the Axis losses occurring after the airlift had started. Speaking of the airlift, Major General Viktor Kargeniko, seen here with Manfred von Richthofen, the Red Baron in the First World War, was in command of the airlift, and they were off to a bad start. This was partly because Kargeniko and his staff didn't have experience of dealing with such a major resupply operation. Few did. So, in the end, Richthofen put Fiebig of 8th Flieger Corps in charge of the airlift from the 28th of November onwards, although full command wasn't taken until the 30th. Well, on the 26th of November, 35 or 37 transports delivered either 50 or 72 tonnes into Stalingrad, which was about 250 tonnes less than the minimum target. 290 men were transported out of the pocket. On the 27th, 14 transports delivered 28 tonnes and took 200 men from the pocket, and on the 28th, 55 aircraft delivered 101 tonnes, which was the first time they'd reached 100 tonnes or more. They followed up this success on the 29th with just 25 aircraft delivering 46 tonnes. They did send up 98 aircraft on the 30th of November and delivered 129 tonnes, if you believe Pickard and Milch, but Richthofen said they delivered 161 tonnes on the 30th, so it depends on who you believe. What's interesting to me about these numbers is the variance. 55 transports delivered 101 tonnes on the 28th. That's roughly 1.83 tonnes per aircraft. But 98 transports delivered just 129 tonnes on the 30th, roughly 1.31 tonnes per aircraft. This is a huge discrepancy. Had the 98 aircraft on the 30th carried 1.83 tonnes per aircraft, like they had on the 28th, they would have delivered 179 tonnes, not 129. So that's an extra 50 tonnes of supplies that they didn't deliver as a result of, well, what? Did they not load their planes up efficiently? Did not all the 98 planes arrive, and thus the 129 is the amount they got through? Or what? Not sure. This could be an indication that the type of cargo being delivered may have taken up more space. So, as a hypothetical example, a ton of iron would occupy a smaller amount of space on an aircraft than a ton of feathers. Maybe they could theoretically carry two tons of iron, but only one ton of feathers, simply because there wasn't enough room to fit the feathers in the aircraft. Applying this principle to the real-life scenario, maybe fuel occupied more room in the aircraft than ammunition, or the other way around, and thus this would account for the discrepancies. It's not clear, but I will point out that this isn't the only time this sort of thing happens. 35 or 37 aircraft went up on the 26th of November, and 35 aircraft went up on the 1st of December. Yet on the 26th they delivered either 50 or 72 tonnes, and on the 1st they delivered 85 tonnes. Same or similar number of planes, but completely different results. In fact, two more planes may have gone up on the 26th, yet delivered less tons than on the 1st. Now, obviously, they still missed their 300 ton target, regardless of what happened here. The average number of tons delivered between the 25th and 29th of November 1942, depending on the source, was either 53.8 or 62.6 tonnes per day. However, the point is that they may have been operating inefficiently, and they may have been able to deliver more tonnes than they otherwise did had they loaded up their planes better. There were also issues with the planes and the crews themselves, as Craig points out. Some transports were old and untrustworthy. Others lacked guns and radios. Crews ranged from veterans to green graduates of training schools in Germany. Many flyers came to Russia in regular issue clothing without any garments suited for below zero temperatures. There were other issues too. Karavagrad and Zaporozh's airfields were supposed to winterize the aircraft. However, personnel assigned to these bases were more concerned with reporting turnaround statistics than with properly preparing the aircraft for the Russian snow and ice. 
Accordingly, the aircraft arrived at Tatsinskaya ill-prepared for winter employment and choked the airfield awaiting proper equipment. Well, the 6th Army reported on the 26th that ammunition consumption for the 51st Army Corps alone was 228 tonnes per day. The 4th Army Corps was consuming 175 tonnes per day, and the Army only had 707 tonnes of ammunition left. They were receiving 62.6 tonnes of supplies at most, which, even if we said all of that was ammunition, wasn't enough to even cover half of the 4th Army Corps' daily consumption of ammunition, and was less than a third of what was needed for the 51st Army Corps. Clearly, this was unsustainable, and more supplies had to be flown in as soon as possible. In the meantime, ammunition consumption fell the next day, the 27th, to 74 tonnes for the 4th Army Corps, and 128 tonnes for the 51st Army Corps, probably because the troops were trying to conserve ammunition. But this was still far in excess of what was being brought in. Previously, we heard that it was unclear when the meeting between Hitler, Zeitzler and Goering took place, or whether Goering had the ability to teleport around Europe or not. As a brief reminder, the traditional narrative says that Goering was with Hitler at Berchtesgaden on the 22nd, then went to Paris for some art dealings, and then went to East Prussia on the 24th to argue with Zeitzler in front of Hitler. Since this was a lot of jumping around in a very short space of time, I concluded that this first meeting probably didn't take place. But it turns out that Hayward, in his book, Stopped at Stalingrad, has more details on this debate. Being the guy in charge of the Luftwaffe, I assume that Goering flew around Europe in a plane. But Hayward says no, Goering was actually travelling in his own personal train, Asia. This means that Goering absolutely couldn't have made this journey in that time. Haywood therefore believes that the second meeting between Hitler, Goering and Zeitzler couldn't have occurred before the 27th, which was three days after Hitler had already given the green light to the airlift. Despite the claims of numerous writers, therefore, the argument played no part in the decision-making process. The die had already been cast. So, we either have the meeting taking place on the 24th, but without the initial meeting, or we have it occurring on the 27th, which means that the German High Command only came to the conclusion that the airlift would fail after it had already begun, which is counter to the narrative that the German generals were pushing after the war. Either way, the 6th Army was already surrounded when the airlift idea was first questioned in the High Command, and had to continue under those circumstances. So even though Richthofen and others were complaining that the airlift couldn't work, such arguments are rendered mute because their only option was to continue to supply the 6th Army by air until a relief operation or a breakout occurred. And the 6th Army definitely needed supplies via the air during this period. Whether they actually received the official rations or not is one thing, but the daily ration for a typical 6th Army soldier before the encirclement is as shown. Now, people have complained in the past when I started talking about calories, because I've not got 7 degrees in dietary bro science engineering, but by punching the numbers into a calorie website I found, we can come to some rough estimates for the calorie intake. If you'd rather do your own number crunching, feel free, but at least this will give you a rough idea. And in total, a soldier of the 6th Army prior to encirclement would theoretically have received around 3,800 calories per day. But on the 26th of November 1942, these rations were cut significantly, basically by half. Again, the calories are a rough estimate, but theoretically, after the 26th of November 1942, the overall calorie intake was approximately 2,359. That's actually not a bad amount, low for a soldier in winter conditions, and they probably lose some weight, but they're certainly not at starvation levels yet. If this was just a temporary reduction for a couple of weeks or so, then the soldiers would most likely recover from this. That's assuming, of course, that the rations stayed at this level. Also, official rations aren't the same as actual rations. 
On the 26th, the bread ration was officially cut to 400 grams. But in his memoirs, Hull mentions that bread rations were actually reduced to 200 grams on the 23rd of November. So he was receiving less than half of the cut ration three days before the cut was made. Now, memoirs aren't the most reliable of primary sources, because the memory of the writer fades over time. So maybe Hall got the date wrong, or got the amount wrong. Maybe he received extra meat rations to compensate. We don't know. But it could also be an indication that the food situation was worse than officially let on. And the troops may have been receiving less than the 2,300 calories we calculated before. Either way, the 6th Army only had supplies for six days of full rations when the encirclement began. At half rations, this meant that they only had 12 days of food left, meaning that they'd have to mount a breakout soon if the airlift didn't pick up the slack. Pickert explained to Manstein that the entire 6th Army only had enough ammunition to fight for one day of intense action and there wasn't enough fuel for a breakout. In fact, the 6th Army was reporting that they had no fuel at all, with only small reserves available for individual tank movements. With so little fuel and ammunition, Manstein himself questions whether an independent breakout by the 6th Army was even feasible. Thus, they needed supplies by air during this time if it was to have any hope of survival or a breakout. Which is why the airlift, whether it fully worked or not, had to happen. Worse, after talking with Richthofen on the 27th, Manstein was now having doubts whether the airlift could ever succeed. Which meant he had to act fast to get his own relief operation on the go. On the other side of the wire, Vatutin told Stalin that he believed that the Germans would strike from the Schur area since that was the closest area to the pocket. Yeremenko also believed the same, despite the fact that he was in charge of the thin strip of Soviet troops along the Kotonikova front, the place Manstein was actually going to strike. But Zhukov, who wasn't anywhere near this area at the time, was of a different opinion. The trapped German forces are not likely to try to break out without help from a relief force. The German command will evidently attempt to hold its position at Stalingrad. It will mass a relief force for a thrust to form a corridor to supply and eventually evacuate the trapped forces. So there was a debate going on at the time over this. However, regardless of what the Germans were doing, the Soviets were making plans of their own. Operation Uranus had been the first planned operation in the Stalingrad area, but not the last. The second operation was Operation Saturn, designed to occur after Operation Uranus and the encirclement of the 6th Army. Discussion about this operation had been going on for some time, but had intensified since the 23rd, with Vasilevsky submitting the draft plan on the 25th. The aim of Operation Saturn was to have the 1st and 3rd Guards armies, supported by 5th Tank and 6th Armies, smash through the Italian 8th Army and the area now commanded by Army Group Hollett. They would link up in the Milarovo region to encircle the two Axis formations, destroy them, and then have 2nd Guards Army race to Rostov in the second phase of the operation. This would cut off Army Group Don and Army Group A in the Caucasus region and, as Stalin knew all too well, would also prevent the Germans from rescuing the 6th Army at Stalingrad. Such was the importance of this operation that three Guards armies were assigned to the mission as well as another regular army. The Germans were, therefore, in a very dangerous situation. On the one hand, they had to save the 6th Army. On the other, if they didn't reinforce their line along the Schur and south of Stalingrad, the Soviets might thrust Rostov there and cut off Army Group A in the Caucasus. But on top of that, they now had a new threat building against the Italian 8th Army and Army Group Hollett, which also threatened to thrust to Rostov to achieve the same objective. In other words, they had to save the 6th Army in the next few days before disaster struck.
On the 28th of November 1942, First Guards Army struck against Hollitz divisions and pushed them back across the Krivaya River. But along the rest of the Schur, both sides were so exhausted that they were unable to make any headway against each other. Several Soviet divisions were moving south to reinforce the line, though. Plieve's 3rd Guards Cavalry Corps had to relieve Butkov's depleted 1st Tank Corps, allowing them to move into reserve to rest and receive reinforcements. And while the line didn't move much, the 333rd Rifle Division did force Kantkupa Schmidt to withdraw to the edges of the town of Sorovakino. However, the first elements of a new division, Volta Lux 336th Infantry Division, began to arrive and take up positions between Schmidt and Adam, thereby giving weight to the German line in the area. Manstein's aim now was to hold on to the Kotelnikova and Don areas and build up a force capable of striking all the way to Stalingrad. And the Kotelnikova axis seemed like the most obvious choice, since he only faced two exhausted Soviet cavalry divisions and a few rifle divisions that were scattered over a large area, and had just received the 6th Panzer Division plus other units. Raus had received more reinforcements as his division continued to arrive, and wondered why the Soviets weren't trying to destroy them. Instead of attacking while they still had superior numbers, the Russians idly watched for 10 days as our strength in the town increased. I have never resolved this enigma. Shapkin was actually withdrawing most of his 4th Cavalry Corps to the north after the German motorized elements had tried to surround the 81st Cavalry Division. Shapkin retreated until he realised that the Germans weren't actually pursuing him. Yeremenka then ordered Trofanov to stop the withdrawal and attack once more, which he did, although with much caution, aiming for the area north of Kotelnikova. It seems, though, that the Soviets didn't actually have the superior force that Rouse believed they had. Yes, they had more men but they were spread out over a large area, were exhausted after many days of fighting, had gone further than their logistics could take them, and didn't have the forces necessary to fight a German panzer division, which they thought had fully arrived. That's why they were cautious, and that's why they didn't push Raus back as he expected. The Soviets continued to mount attacks all around the pocket, with most of them being beaten back. The only exception was that Batov sent the 91st Tank Brigade and the 34th Rifle Division across the Don and, after a full day of fighting, captured Vertiachi that evening. The Soviet 66th Army also tried to take Orlovka, and, although they made some local gains, weren't able to take the village, thanks to the efforts of men like Hull, who somehow survived a Katyusha rocket bombardment despite being caught out in the open. Hull's regiment commander, Oberst Grosser, was mortally wounded and replaced by Oberleutnant Kells until a new commander could be found. Grosser would die on the 1st of December 1942, aged 57. Overall, the reduction in the intensity of fighting resulted in a decreased expenditure of ammunition. The 4th Army Corps used up just 32 tonnes, while the 51st Army Corps used 96 tonnes. This was still more than the 45 or 101 tonnes flown in, depending on the source you use, but did mean that they weren't using up their limited supplies so rapidly. Nevertheless, Manstein slowly came to realise that the airlift wasn't going to work, and also believed that the 6th Army wasn't in a position to break out of its pocket. He therefore informed the High Command on this day that, in the event that his forces did link up, the 6th Army should withdraw and abandon Stalingrad. It would take Hitler a few days to respond to this information, so in the meantime, Manstein just had to continue building up his forces and hope for the best. On the 29th, the 21st Cavalry Division held off more Axis attacks against its bridgehead, while the 5th and 6th Guards Cavalry Divisions with some tanks from Butkov's 1st Tank Corps and 1st Sin's 258th Rifle Division assaulted the German defences along the Lower Schur. Schockel, Adam and Goebel held firm, which might be surprising given the composition of their forces, but the fact is that the Soviets were exhausted by this point and simply didn't have the strength to penetrate the weak line ahead of them. And while the 119th Rifle Division did penetrate into Sorovikino, 
Kampfgruppe Schmidt was able to slow them to a crawl in the urban environment. However, Makarenka's 321st Rifle and Pastrovich's 40th Guards Rifle Divisions arrived and started to help 8th Cavalry Corps fight against Group Starhill at Oblivskaya, putting intense pressure on this Luftwaffe unit. South of the Don, the 60th Mechanized Brigade and the 158th Tank Regiment did manage to take a village south of Logovsky. But neither unit had enough riflemen to clear the marshlands in the area or reach the Don. And Trofanov's cautious advance was slowed even further by the general himself, as information poured in about the build-up of German forces ahead of him. At this point, General Kirchner wanted to advance to the Aksai River in order to gain a forward-jumping-off position for the relief attempt. Rouse disagreed, pointing out that such a front would be too wide for his lone division, and instead insisted that they hold on to the Kotelnikova area, which is what they ended up doing. Given the weakness of Trofanov's forces, was this a missed opportunity by the Germans to deploy closer to Stalingrad? Tolbukhin's and Shumilov's forces attacked the pocket once more, but again failed to penetrate the line and took heavy losses in their attempts. However, Paulus knew his line in the west couldn't hold much longer. So, starting at midday, the various units began their withdrawal. This allowed the Soviets to capture Sokarevka, Ilarionovsky, and Peskovatka. And it was only on the 30th that the Germans stopped on the designated ridge line, halting the Soviet advance as well. This line would end up being the western front of the Stalingrad pocket for the next few weeks, and the infamous pocket was now formed. Otherwise, not a lot happened at Stalingrad this day. Southwest of the pocket, 3rd Guards Cavalry and 1st Tank Corps attacked again, but neither made any progress whatsoever. Mativ's 333rd Rifle Division captured a railway station in the area, then got across the Shur River and captured the village of Golovsky in the morning. Somehow, Starhill held on at Oblivskaya as the better portion of four Soviet divisions attacked his Luftwaffe brigade on three flanks. And having received two divisions as reinforcements the previous day, the 8th Cavalry Corps managed to carve small bridgeheads over the Schur in Kampfgruppe Spang's sector. But these were only minor gains, and Romanenko wasn't happy with Borisov's failure, ordering the 50th Guards Rifle Division to relieve the 21st Cavalry Division so that it could move to Oblivskaya as well. It wasn't able to move though, as it was locked in combat with the 48th Panzer Corps, itself under attack by the 47th Guards and 346 Rifle Divisions. They took a small village, but Kramer responded by sending the Romanian 1st Armoured Division to the area, and a long fight ensued, which would last until the next day, with neither side really able to gain the advantage. So yes, all of Vatutin's forces were exhausted by this point, and the Germans had reinforced the area with just enough forces to bring about a stalemate. By this point, Operation Uranus had cost the Soviets 79,400 men, 18,400 of which were killed. They'd lost 359 tanks and 125 aircraft, but they had also liberated 700 Soviet tanks and 6,000 prisoners of war. The Axis, on the other hand, had lost 145,000 men, 300 tanks and 250 aircraft, plus a host of other equipment. The main issue here for the Soviets was that they were being pulled in two directions. They had to tackle the pocket, but they also had to form an outer encirclement front and guard against a possible relief attempt. Therefore, they faced a dilemma. Do they concentrate on the pocket, or do they pull forces from the pocket? And in some ways, they did both. They pulled forces from the western portion of the pocket and sent them to the Schur area, then left the forces outside the southern part of the pocket alone, with nothing going south to form an outer encirclement line there. Effectively, their line along the Schur became strong enough to resist a relief attempt, but the Southern Front did not, so it's no wonder Manstein chose to attack from the Kotlnikova region. But the success of Operation Uranus must have been very shocking to the German High Command, especially Hitler. Never before had the Soviets achieved a breakthrough of their lines, never mind an encirclement of an entire army. 
This had left the Axis in a dire state. The Romanian Third Army had about 83,000 men at this time, although 30,000 of these were reassembling in the rear, having come from units that had disintegrated. Hollett had 75,000 men, many of whom were Romanian troops, and 1st Guards and 5th Tank Army still had around 160,000 men in total. Thus, both sides had similar numbers of troops in this area. At the pocket, each German division was opposed by two or three Soviet rifle divisions, all similar. But even at this point, the German divisions still had almost double the strength of a typical Soviet division at this time, so we have to take that into consideration. Therefore, some authors say that the Axis in the pocket were outnumbered by roughly 2.5 to 1. However, the Soviets had about 710,000 men, and the Axis had 310,000 men in the pocket. So, it was slightly more than 2.3 to 1. In addition to the 94th Infantry Division, the 384th Infantry Division was also disbanded at some point around this time too. Paulus was promoted to General Oberst, Colonel General, and with 6th Army Headquarters spread out over the Gumrak airfield, itself littered with wreckage from the previous fighting, Paulus shockingly refused to allow Gumrak to be prepared to accept aircraft. Their headquarters were there, along with hospitals, supply installations, and several command posts, so they did not want any construction that might attract Soviet attention to their location. This decision would obviously come to haunt them in the near future, but might indicate that Paulus didn't think they would need the airfield, perhaps because he expected to break out or be relieved, and Manstein's intention was to relieve him. But would he be able to succeed? When were his panzers arriving, and when could he launch his attack? Would it be in the first week of December? We'll find out next time. Thanks for watching, bye for now.